This morning, betrayal in the Texas House. A politically wounded Dade Phelan, confident he can get reelected, but one of Phelan's lieutenants, Tom Oliverson, now wants Phelan's job as House Speaker, and he is not waiting to see if Phelan survives his May runoff. State Rep. Brian Harrison on the changing politics of the State House. Texas is not a red state, it is a green state. Just ask President Biden. Texans gave him millions of dollars for his November re-election last week. Can Congress help save rural hospitals? The House Ways and Means Committee holding a rare field hearing in Denton. Congresswoman Beth Van Dyne on the federal role in improving health care. And the dizzying legal battle over Senate Bill 4. On again, then off again. State Rep. Armando Wally joins us from Houston on what happens next. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good Sunday morning. Let's get things going here with the top political headlines happening across our state. Governor Abbott says Texas is now just two votes away in the legislature from getting school vouchers passed. Abbott helped defeat incumbent Republicans this month who oppose vouchers. The governor says he now has 74 votes in the House to support vouchers, but he needs 76. The governor is campaigning to defeat the remaining Republican incumbents in the May runoff election. You know, hand counting election ballots is not as easy as it sounds. Republicans in Gillespie County discovered that one. The GOP there in Fredericksburg decided to hand count 8,000 ballots on Super Tuesday, but they made errors in almost every precinct. None of those errors changed the outcome of the races, but it is ironic considering they did not trust the voting machines to tabulate the results. And this is what we delve into in our latest episode of Yalitics, which is out this morning. And an interesting political moment in Dallas the other day. Governor Greg Abbott and House Speaker Dave Phelan appearing together as Phelan fights for political survival. They were at an event in Dallas about a big investment in building semiconductors here in the state. You know, Abbott did not take sides in Phelan's race, but the governor did invite the speaker to appear with him in Dallas at that event. And speaking of Speaker Phelan, he often avoids cameras, but he was ready to talk in Dallas the other day, expressing confidence that he can come from behind to win the May runoff election. And he also took aim at his political nemesis, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. He absolutely is not satisfied with being the lieutenant governor anymore. He wants to be the Speaker of the Texas House. And no one, no one in the Texas House wants the lieutenant governor to be the Speaker of the Texas House. Are you disappointed that Governor Abbott didn't endorse you this time? No, you know, uh, those are the big three. You know, typically, we stay out of each other's races. That's been the tradition here in the state of Texas. Of course, the lieutenant governor decided not to follow that tradition. He crossed that Rubicon, um, and that's, that's, his, that's his issue going forward with the Texas House. And so um, the tradition of the Texas House is the lieutenant governor, the governor, the speaker stay in their lanes. And um, so, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not in any way um, you know, disappointed at all. Well, one of Phelan's committee chairmen announced a run for House Speaker before we even know what happens to Phelan. State Rep. Tom Oliverson there represents Northwest Harris County. He is an anesthesi anesthesiologist there in the Houston area, and he said school choice and removing Democratic committee chairs are his top priorities. You know, the politics of the Texas House are changing, and State Rep. Brian Harrison is a Republican representing Midlothian, and he leads us off this morning. Representative, good to see you again here. Tom Oliverson announced he is going to run for the Speakership of the Texas House. What will he have to do, do you think, to convince a majority of Republicans to get behind him? Well, it's really fascinating. My biggest takeaway from seeing this announcement is that the grassroots are absolutely destroying the liberal uniparty establishment that has been controlling the Texas House for far too long. We know we now have literally members of Dade Phelan's own leadership team saying that Dade Phelan's leadership team was a disaster and that we are no longer going to have Democrat committee chairs, Democrat parliamentarians. That's, of course, the new baseline now for us. The Republican voters across the state of Texas, they spoke loudly and clearly in last week's primaries and the establishment has no choice uh, but to recognize that. And I think that's the biggest takeaway out of this announcement is that the grassroots conservatives are beating the liberal establishment. What, what kind of school choice bill would you get behind? I mean, there, there's all kinds that are going to be on the table next year. What, what, what amount? What, what would you be looking for? I want one that is universal. I believe every parent, you know, and, and, and I'll tell you why, Jason. I firmly believe that every child 
deserves a quality education. And I say this as somebody who is a proud public school parent myself. I've got four young kids. They attend local public schools. My dad is a local public school board member. The private schools, the charter schools, uh, the uh, homeschoolers, and uh, the public schools, everybody would be improved by letting competition do in education what it does in every sector of our economy, where over time quality goes up. Um, and costs go down. We could do this in a way that's fully, truly universal. We could save taxpayer monies and we could empower every parent to choose where their child attends. And let me tell you what, every state that's tried this, we have improved outcomes for students. Parents are empowered. Teacher salaries uh, go up. It's good for teachers. People often overlook this. Um, and it improves the local public schools. If you are pro-public schools, if you want what Governor Abbott wants, what I want for Texas public schools to be the best in America, the only correct position is to support education, freedom, and school choice. Where do you see common ground with a minority party, with Texas Democrats? There are lots of areas where we can find common ground where we both want to advance the cause of liberty. And, and, you, and I have done this. I have joint authored legislation with some of the most liberal Democrats in the Texas House when I believe the legislation would advance the cause of liberty. But being bipartisan does not mean you have to put the other team in charge. It would be quite literally the same as if Speaker Mike Johnson made Nancy Pelosi or AOC a powerful committee chair in D.C. No Republican in America would stand for that. But that's what's been happening happening in the Texas House for decades. Republican voters have been sold out behind their backs in closed door meetings um, in Austin, Texas, where they, you know, Republicans campaign for office, telling their voters they're going to fight for cons conservatism. But then when they get elected, they cut deals with Democrats and collude with them to destroy liberty. That day is done. Texas voters have spoken. They've had enough. And we're going to take over the Texas House and we're going to fundamentally reform it and make it representative of the freedom loving Texans and give them finally the government that they deserve. Representative, we appreciate the time as always. Thank you. Always great to talk to you, uh, Jason. All right, let's bring in the roundtable now to discuss the politics of this, the changing politics in the Texas House. Bud Kennedy is here from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. I am Mitra with us from Austin at the Texas Tribune and Bernadine Steptoe, political producer at WFAA in Dallas. Uh, Bud, the first question, Tom Oliverson, why is he announcing before the May runoff when we find out what happens to Dade Phelan? I think it's specifically for the runoff. I, I think it's meant to send a message to the voters in Orange and Beaumont that if, if they think they need to reelect the speaker, that Dade Phelan might not be the speaker. He's getting out there. They're creating that doubt about Dade feeling right away. It's a, a play to hurt him more in the runoff. And Ian Oliverson has served for four terms so far. Is he somebody that Republicans could get behind? You know, possibly, but it's still a long ways off but beyond the runoffs in the general election. When you're talking about when the speaker will be elected, it'll be in January of next year. You know, Oliverson uh, will most likely be joined by other people uh, in the race. So, you know, he's going to have to show his, his bona fides in a way. And, you know, that's going to be a tough thing when there's a lot of competition. Does Speaker Phelan survive this, Bernadine? Well, I think so. And I think so because he's going to get out there and campaign just as hard and there's only going to be two of them. But I think that at this point, whoever comes out against him and, and he's viewed as wounded has a less chance to me of becoming Speaker because the Phelan does still have support in the House. He does. He needs it in the district, though, to get reelected, I guess. Well, not for the Speaker. Well, he has to get reelected before he can become speaker, reelected to his, his position there in the House. A lot more ahead here on Inside Texas Politics, including this. When we come back here, 18 members of Congress convene in Denton last week, looking for a bipartisan way to improve health care and save rural hospitals. Republican Congresswoman Beth Van Dyne takes our questions from that rare field hearing. But first, Senate Bill 4, the legal battle ahead over this state's attempt to enforce immigration law. State Rep. Armando Wally is up next from Houston on Inside Texas Politics. Welcome back to Inside Texas Politics. Texas Republicans have a lot riding on what happens in a New Orleans courtroom. That's where the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals meets, where judges will decide whether to let Senate Bill 4 become law. This, of course, is the one that lets state and local police detain anyone who cannot prove their citizenship. State Rep. Armando Wally is a Democrat representing parts of Houston, and he is not shy about what he says this bill will do if judges let it take effect. Representative, welcome back to the program here. A lot has happened over the last few days since, since all this transpired. I'm curious kind of how things have played out for you, what you've heard from constituents, because it was on again, then off again. 
Well, uh, thank you for allowing me to be on the show. Um, from a constituent standpoint, uh, Houston, Harris County, there's 5 million people that live in Houston, Harris County. 40 plus percent of that population uh, has a Spanish surname. Uh, and so we are a welcoming community. Uh, people love to gravitate towards Houston, Harris County, uh, precisely because of that diversity. Uh, and so you have um, a lot of folks that are very fearful uh, of being unjustly stopped. Uh, I personally, look, I, I'm a proud American, born in this country. Uh, on my mother's side, three or four generations uh, of, of Texans, of proud Texans and proud, and, and, and ultimately proud Americans. Uh, but my father was born in Mexico. Uh, and so we have uh, obviously roots in Mexico. We, we don't want a situation where uh, we, uh, Folks that look like us are, are one not unjustly stopped, but two that a lot of our immigrant communities uh, fearful that that uh, they can't call law enforcement when uh, when they are victims of crime as well. There's still legal challenges that lie ahead here. A lot of people are predicting this is still going to end up back in the Supreme Court when the justices will actually consider the merits of the case, which they didn't do uh, the other day. When the merits are considered, will SB four survive, or what will happen? Uh, we we obviously are going to uh, use every tool available, uh, legal tool available to um, stop this bill from becoming law uh, or, or being enforced. I'm sorry, it's already law, but being enforced. Uh, and well, and what, we're just, what, are your, what, what are your legal options, though? Well, that, that's what the judicial process is for. And that's where that's where um, you have an expedited uh, process now at the Fifth Circuit uh, should a uh, whatever decision they make, I, I'm I'm almost positive there will be a, a direct appeal to the United States Supreme Court to also make a, de a determination. It's a uh, it's not a favorable court, the Fifth Circuit, nor the United States uh, uh, Supreme Court, and so uh, we're just hopeful that that uh, cooler heads prevail, and that looking at our constitutional structure, where states are part of the United States, and there's certain limitations to that uh, to that authority, just like. Uh, uh, the U.S. Congress uh, has certain uh, uh, statutory authority uh, based on our U.S. Constitution, because ultimately the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land, uh, but it's really how it's interpreted. Uh, and right now, you, you cannot have a state uh, going rogue in, in trying to enforce federal immigration law that th where they have no, um, no training, uh, not that they don't have any role in it, um, but that uh, they're, they're trying to usurp uh, your U.S. Border Patrol law enforcement arm uh, of the United States. Representative, we are out of time. I appreciate the, uh, the insight, though. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. You know, it's not often Congress gets outside the beltway, but last week, 18 members of the House Ways and Means Committee moved a hearing on health care outside of their stuffy conference rooms there at the U.S. Capitol and into a helicopter hangar in Denton. Congresswoman Beth Van Dyne among those helping to organize this hearing on health care. She is a Republican from Irving. Congresswoman, good to see you again. Good to see you. When people think about, about the state of health care, there's a lot of issues that, that yeah. need to be solved. But the first thing I think of is the rural areas that are losing the hospitals. Yeah. That seems to be a county issue or a local issue. Is there a federal role there? Well, when you look at the hospitals that are losing, they're losing um, uh, the, the rural areas that are losing their, their hospitals, one of the reasons is reimbursement rates and how costly it is to provide health care. You know, while may, more people may have access to health insurance, it doesn't mean they've got access to health care. And when the cost is so excessive that they can't afford it, even if, they have, if they're covered by insurance, it's, it's basically the same thing as not having it, but you're, you, it's the, one of the largest um, um, costs per month that people pay for a service they can't even afford to use. One of the problems that we've found, and this is from various uh, roundtables, healthcare roundtables that I've had in this district, what we're hearing from providers is the amount of excessive regulations and the regulatory burdens that are being placed on them by the federal agencies. Like Medicare, Medicaid, those Medicare, things? Medicare, well, what? CMS. The amount okay. of paperwork that they have to do, the amount of administrative work that they have to do. If it's a large healthcare system, they can spread it out. They actually have a whole department that's focused on regulatory issues. But when you look at some of the smaller healthcare systems, when you look at the smaller um, on single uh, solo practitioners, the small group practices, they can't. And as a result, they're either forced to sell to a large healthcare network or go out of business. What could the federal government do, though? Cut the red tape? I mean, what kind Cut of, the red tape, absolutely. What, what kind of bills do you expect to come out of this? Well, we have a No Transparency Act, for example, that got passed. 
The idea, and we had a ton of support for it, the idea was to provide transparency to patients when they were looking at their healthcare options to make sure that they knew what the costs were going to be. What we have found, though, in the last three years is how that, that, that bill has been uh, articulated, how it's being um, executed by CMS, is completely against the intent of the law. So making sure that we're holding the agencies that have to do with healthcare, for example, CMS, accountable for how they're actually implementing our regulations is important. How they're implementing the law, the intent of the law is important. And I think you're going to hear from, from witnesses today that I've heard from um, at various roundtables in North Texas, the way that CMS is implementing these laws is not with the intent, it's not helpful, it doesn't do anything to help the, the, their patient care, but does everything to increase costs, to increase time of, of, uh, of, of patient access, and to de decrease access. Congresswoman, thank you for the time. Thank you very much, it's good to have you here. Texans gave President Biden millions of dollars for his re-election campaign, and Biden is winning the money race right now, but what does that mean for the November election, especially here in Texas? The roundtable is ready when we return. And if you want to keep up with Texas politics during the week, subscribe to our podcast. It's called Y'all Ticks. New content, fresh interviews. Episodes drop every Sunday morning wherever you get your podcasts. This is Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley. All right, back now with the roundtable to put the headlines in perspective. Bud Kennedy is back with us. I am Mitra's with us, and of course, Bernadine Steptoe as well. Bud, let's start with you again. Uh, you know, President Biden here in Texas, between Dallas and Houston, raising millions of dollars. It's still a red state, and people are wondering, well, you know, how did he get this much money? But what can he do with winning the money race in Texas? Well, everybody wins the money race in Texas yes. because Texas is where the money is. New York is the number one state for campaign money. California is number Texas is number three. Everybody gets money out of Texas. Last election, Trump got twice as much as Biden did out of Texas. This year, I mean, Trump, Trump will get more than Biden this cycle. Maybe not twice as much if we look at how uh, Trump's fundraising is lagged behind. But, you know, Texans feel like they have no other say-so in the race. They might as well give money. And I, you know, I was talking to some Democrats, and they were saying that this, this, you know, generosity might flow downhill to other candidates like Colin Allred. Well, that's certainly the hope, and certainly, you know, uh, President Biden was talking, praising Colin Allred, and you know, the the the, the Democrats see Allred's race in challenging Ted, Ted Cruz as their, you know, as one of their best chances to actually flip a seat because they're playing defense and. In, on the Senate side in uh, many other states. Uh, so that's where they're hoping that they can make some uh, inroads. And, and Bernadine, you know, we're still, what, six, seven months, eight months out from the election here. What do you take away from, from Biden winning the money race right now so early? Well, I think that at this point, you have a lot of donors who don't necessarily want former President uh, Donald Trump, and he has so, so many legal issues that they're just not betting their money, and they're hoping that Biden will probably um, keep his seat. But with that said, Texas, as Buzz said, Texas has always been a money, an ATM for candidates, particularly uh, presidential candidates. But that does not mean that um, President Biden is going to do well in Texas. It's just that he's going to raise the money. Yeah, of course, money never equal success. It certainly yeah. can help you frame a message, but it never equals success. But the other big story uh, happening nationally that has a direct impact on Texas is Senate Bill 4. Dizzying week for that. On again, off again law, uh, you know, from the courts here. Is all that chaos a good sign or bad sign for the future of this? Well, you know, I think, and of course they did kick it back to the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit, uh, this was all procedure. Uh, this was an argument over whether to delay enforcement while they heard the bill. You know, the Fifth Circuit tried to punt it up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, 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 you take care of it down there. So that's what happened last week. And the hearing in the Fifth Circuit didn't totally go Texas's way. You know, there are questions about it. Uh, the big thing is that there's so much uh, just misconception about this bill. Uh, people on both sides think that everybody's suddenly going to be locked up. Uh, you know, the, the, are not, the bill only applies to people if they can prove they were crossing the border illegally. Uh, it doesn't apply to people who come and overstay a visa. It doesn't apply to people you see on the street. It only applies if you see somebody crossing the border. And the, the people who are celebrating saying, now we can lock up all these migrants, that's not the case. Uh, Ian, what do you make of this? Well, certainly there's uncertainty. There's not just uncertainty among, uh, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty among law enforcement. They don't know exactly, you know, if you went to bed on Tuesday night, uh, you may have uh, seen that, uh, you know, that the law was in effect and you woke up Wednesday morning and it was not. And so 
you know, law enforcement still are trying to figure out how they're going to work with this bill. It's, it, you know, there's a lot of confusion. And so they're just kind of, and everyone's just kind of waiting to see what actually pops out of this. Bernadine? Well, and also interpretation of the law isn't as much of a fear as profiling that those, those sheriffs or those police officers or whoever who want to just arrest uh, those who it would affect, that's where the fear is. And uh, the mere fact that, and I'm never trying to interpret how the United States Supreme Court will rule, but the fact that it's going back and forth and back and forth lets you sort of wonder what's actually going to happen with this law. And, and, but go ahead. The, the sheriffs talk to DAs, and the DAs say, look, if you bring cases that don't have probable cause, that costs us money in court. We have to pay public defenders. Don't bring these cases unless they're good cases. Don't arrest people. Well, yeah, but that doesn't matter. They still profile. Uh, I, and let me go back to you on this one. You know, as Bud mentioned here a moment ago, in front of the Chief Justice of the, uh, of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, the, the Texas uh, attorneys, the solicitor, solicitor General, couldn't answer some basic questions about, you know, what this law would fully do. Mm-hmm. And this is what it's adding to the confusion about uh, what's, what's, how this will actually work in effect. I mean, I think there's a lot of a lot of confusion too, just about in terms of like, you know, law enforcement, there's not, do they have the facilities to kind of, uh, to, to, to handle, you know, the impacts of this law, whether it's smaller jails, facilities like that, you know, there's a lot that are is still to be accounted for with the actual impacts. You know, yeah. The Arizona bill was supported by jail construction companies. I'm sure they're excited about this. And uh, it just makes you wonder if the lawmakers knew what they were doing. Well, <laughs> we, we shall see what the courts say. Guys, thanks so much. Appreciate that. Thank you for watching as well. We're back next Sunday to take you inside Texas politics. Hope to see you then.